Hello, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Gerald Newman, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Program at Harvard Law School. Uh, and we're here today to talk about uh, Title 42 process uh, and litigation in federal court and the Inter-American Commission uh, regarding it. The whole world saw horrifying images this fall of Haitians seeking protection in the United States being driven back into the river by Border Patrol agents on horseback. And thousands of Haitians were then flown rapidly to Haiti, despite the dangerous chaos there following the assassination of its president. If one asks how such brutal treatment is possible in a country that does have a functioning legal system, a big part of the answer is the so-called Title 42 procedure invented by the Trump administration. Today's panel will discuss Title 42 uh, and litigation challenging it in federal court and in the inter-American human rights system. I'm very grateful to my fellow panelists, Professor Denise Gilman, Director of the Immigration Clinic at the University of Texas Austin School of Law, and Professor James Hathaway, the James E. and Sarah A. Deegan Professor of Law and Director of the Program in Refugee and Asylum Law at the University of Michigan Law School. One prominent feature of the Trump administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been the political abuse of public health authorities and rationales for ulterior motives. The particular issue we'll discuss today is the abuse of the Centers for Disease Control to create a shadow immigration enforcement system in order to circumvent the immigration laws and abolish refugee law in the Southwest, uh, as well as to circumvent statutory protections for unaccompanied non-citizen children. It's known as Title 42, which is just the name of an entire volume of the US code which includes the single statutory section on which the procedure relies, 42 U.S.C. Section 265. Uh, in March 2020, the Trump White House pressured CDC to issue a regulation creating a process that authorizes the Department of Homeland Security to expel people from the United States in the name of public health without complying with any of the procedural requirements and substantive safeguards that the law imposes when DHS is enforcing the immigration laws and without respecting international law. We'll explain that in more detail later in the panel. Uh, unfortunately, the Biden administration has continued employing the Title 42 process with some modifications. Uh, and by the end of September, over 1.2 million people have been expelled from the United States without a hearing under Title 42. Uh, those are DHS statistics. Uh, I should mention that all three members of this panel are involved in litigation against Title 42. Professor Gilman is involved in the petition brought to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, and Professor Hathaway and I are amici in federal court cases challenging Title 42, along with Professor Anker of the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Clinic and Professor Elena Kauf of the New School. I'll pass the word first to Professor Gilman to say more about the situation she has observed from her vantage point in Texas. Uh, after that, I will say more about the federal court litigation from a domestic law perspective that interfaces with international law. Then Professor Hathaway will discuss the situation from the perspective of international refugee law. And Professor Gilman will discuss the perspective of the inter-American human rights system and the litigation before the Inter-American Commission. Then we will open up the conversation for questions and answers using the Q&A function uh, of Zoom. Uh, Professor Gilman, please. Thank you so much. It really is an honor to, to be speaking on this panel today. I wish it were under happier circumstances in terms of the, the subject. Um, expulsions under Title 42 really are the norm at our southern border 
as of today right now. Um, so when an asylum seeking adult or family arrives at the border or crosses the border, uh, the most likely result after any encounter with immigration authorities in the border region will be expulsion. And that expulsion will either be all the way back to the home country which the asylum seeker has fled, um, or at least to Mexico, which is the last country from which the asylum seeker came. Uh, I want to be clear that there are other options for the processing that could take place at the border. Uh, everything from the possibility of just putting an asylum seeker into regular immigration court proceedings to have the asylum claim heard either with detention or with release into the United States to go live with family during that process or there's the option of expedited removal proceedings which require a screening interview to determine whether the asylum claim is valid before putting the individual into full-on immigration court proceedings. Um, we may soon be seeing uh, another unfortunate option of the return of the Remain in Mexico program, which does place asylum seekers into immigration court proceedings in the United States on their asylum claims, but then returns the asylum seeker physically to Mexico to await those proceedings. But for now, even though this array of options exists and it's even used in some cases, um, some of these other options, Title 42 expulsions are definitely the norm. How are the decisions made as to when Title 42 is used or something else? Almost impossible to tell. Um, there certainly is a discriminatory feel to the to the choice to use Title 42. For example, Haitians have almost all been exposed to uh, uh, subjected to the Title 42 expulsions when they reach the border, whereas Nicaraguans uh, fleeing recent political events in Nicaragua have had a slightly greater chance of being allowed into the United States to to seek asylum. But to be clear, uh, Title 42 against a full range of nationalities, including, including Cubans who were once somewhat favored under immigration law, to Venezuelans, even to uh, Afghanis uh, who are seeking to enter the United States. Um, as Professor Newman mentioned, there have been a total of more than a million expulsions by now. And I want to be clear that in just September alone, there were 100,000 expulsions under Title 42. So this is a very active program. Quickly on the process, basically what happens is that an individual who will be subjected to Title 42 expulsion is held by the Border Patrol, Border Authorities, um, at the Border Patrol station briefly, and then often is sent to an ICE processing center, an ICE detention center, a little further into the United States, which shows that the rationale of immediate expulsion being required as a pandemic control option uh, is disingenuous because most individuals processed under Title 42 do spend some time in congregate settings in the United States. Theoretically, there's a screening to determine if the person would be tortured in, if, a, if returned to Mexico or home country, those screenings almost never take place and the, a favorable finding is almost never granted. Um, once the person is subjected to Title 42, they may be returned immediately to Mexico just back across the land border where they came from, or they may be shipped to another part of the Texas-Mexico border to cross there because Mexico will not take for example, certain young children, even in families um, in certain parts of the region. So there's also movement around the border, again, demonstrating that pandemic control seems not to be taken at all seriously. Um, and then once uh, where, wherever they're uh, sent back to Mexico um, from, um, the individuals are simply just walked back across the bridge and exposed to extreme danger in Mexico if they are not returned all the way back to their home country. And either one really is an option. Another um, sort of part of the process that often takes place for those who are returned to Mexico is they may be shipped from the northern border of Mexico by Mexican authorities with the cooperation of the US all the way down to the southern Mexico border and essentially shoved back into Central America, uh, which is the place from which many fled in the first place. So that's just kind of a sense of how the expulsions are actually taking place.
Thank you. Uh, I'll speak now about the statutory issues in the federal court litigation over Title 42. Uh, as background, during the Trump administration, the Attorney General and the Department of Homeland Security adopted numerous policies under the immigration laws uh, designed to undermine the rights of asylum seekers and treated children caught up in the immigration system ruthlessly. But the White House saw in the pandemic the opportunity to shut down asylum altogether. Uh, I'll use the term asylum here as shorthand for statutory guarantees of protection from persecution, torture, and death as required by acts of Congress that implement U.S. treaty obligations. Professor Hathaway will say more about the treaty obligations next. Uh, in March 2020, at a time when the pandemic was much more serious in the United States than in Mexico and Central America, the administration got the CDC to issue a regulation and an order redefining its authority to prohibit introduction of persons and goods that might spread communicable diseases. Uh, the purported basis of this regulation is an old provision of the Public Health Service Act that deals with foreign quarantine. And I'm gonna put that up on the screen. Uh, it says that whenever the Surgeon General determines that by reason of the existence of any communicable disease in a foreign country, there is serious danger of the introduction of such disease into the United States, and that this danger is so increased by the introduction of persons or property from such country, that a suspension of the right to introduce such persons and property is required in the interest of public health then the Surgeon General in accordance with regulations approved by the President shall have the power to prohibit in whole or in part the introduction of persons and property from such countries or places as he shall designate in order to avert such danger for such period of time as he may deem necessary for such purpose. That's the whole statutory basis of the Title 42 procedure. Uh, as you may notice, this very old provision, it's quite general uh, and doesn't mention expulsion at all. And as it doesn't specifically contemplate expulsion, it doesn't mention any rights that people subjected to expulsion may have. Uh, also, the focus is on suspending the right to introduce persons and property, a transitive verb. And the target is the act of introduction. Uh, until the past two years, uh, this has always been uh, used with regard to uh, transportation uh, of passengers to the United States. Uh, the new regulation reshapes the power to prohibit in whole or in part the introduction of persons as the power to arrest people in the interior of the United States and to expel them immediately to any country the US chooses without any kind of hearing and without any showing that they themselves pose any health risk whatsoever. Uh, the rationale offered for the new system was that even if the individuals are healthy, they may catch the virus in overcrowded detention centers uh, and then spread it elsewhere. To which the obvious answer is, don't put them in overcrowded detention centers. Additional details have been added later as the policy is periodically renewed most recently in August. It still applies across the board. Uh, it doesn't depend on testing, and it doesn't depend on whether the person is vaccinated, despite the scientific advances that have been made since March of 2020. And the CDC order delegates the power to implement this regime to the same officials who enforce the immigration law without complying with the limits that immigration law places on that enforcement. The government calls this the Title 42 process, and it is a shadow immigration system built alongside the legally authorized immigration control system, which it now refers to as the Title, 40, the Title 8 process. Uh, in particular, the CDC order circumvented the procedures that Congress mandated for expedited removal of people seeking protection as refugees. The prohibition of return to torture the special protections that Congress put in the immigration law for unaccompanied minors. 
The Title 42 process does not apply to citizens or permanent residents or people with valid temporary visas or people who don't need visitors visas. It was clearly targeted at refugees and unaccompanied children seeking protection. Uh, the American Civil Liberties Union brought a legal challenge to this regime in June of 2020 on behalf of a teenage boy who fled threats to his life in Honduras. And a federal judge in the District of Columbia, uh, a Trump appointee, by the way, granted a preliminary injunction against expelling him, finding that he was likely to succeed on his claim that the Title 42 process was unlawful. Uh, both because it was not authorized by Section 265, and because even if it were, it would need to be harmonized with the protections in Title VIII. DHS then mooted out the case by diverting the boy to the normal immigration system. The CDC order includes the possibility for DHS to exclude individuals from the Title 42 process for humanitarian reasons on a totally discretionary case-by-case -case basis. Uh, DHS did that several more times with cases when lawsuits were threatened. Uh, and then finally a class action was brought in the District of Columbia on behalf of unaccompanied minors seeking protection. The district court issued a preliminary injunction in November, 2020, again, finding the plaintiffs likely to succeed on the claim that the Title 42 procedure is unlawful. The government's appeal from that injunction was overtaken by the beginning of the Biden administration. And in February, 2021, the CDC issued an order removing unaccompanied minors from the Title 42 procedure, uh, an order that was made or later made permanent. But the Title 42 procedure still applies to families with children and individual adults. Uh, the current litigation on behalf of families, Huisha Huisha versus Mayorkas, uh, began in January of 2021 and is proceeding as a class action in the same court. Uh, settlement negotiations with the Biden administration failed to prove uh, useful, uh, and the case went to hearing before the same judge who issued a preliminary injunction in September, specifically on the theory that Section 265 does not authorize expulsion. The DC Circuit stayed the injunction pending an expedited appeal, which is now being briefed. Since I am not a fanatic textualist, I don't find the strongest argument to be one based on the grammar of Section 265, though I recognize that appeals courts and the Supreme Court may prefer that form of reasoning. Uh, to me, the structural argument seems more compelling, that the short and general wording of Section 265, even if it can be stretched to reach expulsion, uh, does not override the specific protections for asylum and torture claims that Congress enacted later in the immigration laws, which are what was really intended to govern the subject. Uh, moreover, Congress already created a system of expedited removal in 1996 for use against recently arrived citizens. Uh, it allows for swift removal of people who don't make international protection claims and sets out accelerated procedures for those who do. That is what DHS should be using, not lawless discretionary procedures. Do I have to add? that the refusal of border patrol agents to get vaccinated, the refusal of the Trump administration to build adequate facilities, and the refusal of border states to cooperate with the federal government uh, are not valid reasons for violating federal and international law. Uh, with that, I'll give the word to Professor Hathaway to talk more about the international claims. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that. Uh, I should say that, you know, one of the ironies given that refugees are the target of this policy is that to a very real extent, international refugee law is a supporting actor. Uh, it doesn't have its own enforcement mechanism. It's the only international human rights treaty that lacks that. And hence, we're going to need to think of the utility of refugee law 
as an adjunct either to the domestic uh, measures that Professor Newman has just outlined or to those in the Inter-American system that I think Professor Gilman will lead us through. Let me begin uh, with my favorite, uh, and to my mind, the most important case for any lawyer wanting to do international law in American courts, uh, which is the charming Betsy case going back two centuries. The idea being that there is a canon of construction that if we can construe an act of parliament in a way that doesn't violate international law, we must accept, not may, must accept that interpretation. And so thinking about some of the issues around Title 42, Professor Newman has already mentioned ambiguous phrases like introduction and averting such danger. What do those actually mean? The notion of necessity that he just referred to in his remarks. Similarly, our ideas that to my mind can and should be informed by our international legal obligations. It's not open to us under the Charming Betsy Doctrine simply to ignore the duties that we've assumed that speak to those terms. But more important, I must say, is the inter-American system itself. Uh, the inter-American system, unlike United States law, has actually not only tolerated, but actually quite firmly embraced international refugee law as the core of its own approach at a regional level to understanding asylum. And as you can see, in this extract from its leading case, Pacheco Tineo, the institution of asylum has a form. It has a form in the person of refugee status. In other words, the Inter-American Court has signaled clearly that it intends to interpret obligations of international protection in line with the Refugee Convention, thus giving us the mechanism to enforce that we lack uh, in international refugee law itself. What does that mean then? Well, the governing body of the UN Refugee Agency, its executive committee just last month issued this uh, note on what it thought that means. Uh, vague in general, I must say, uh, the idea that the right to seek asylum and the principle of non reform all have to be complied with. I think the Refugee Agency could and should have said more. Uh, this is not unhelpful, but let me give you some sense of where I think refugee law might actually have real utility. The most critical point of principle is what you see on the screen. I'm, I'm a frequent critic of the UN Refugee Agency, but this particular extract where they say not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, uh, what is the actual cardinal principle of the refugee regime, the importance of this really can't be overstated. That people don't acquire refugee status by virtue of anything a state says or, do, or does. You are a refugee in international law as soon as you in fact meet the criteria of being outside your country owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for one of five reasons. All that the state process does is to declare what already is. When you think about people arriving at the border and being dealt with in the abusive ways that Professor Gilman has already described, you can see, I think, how critical this is, that these individuals are rights holders long before they enter the United States, and certainly uh, before they are found or not found to be a refugee. This is a principle that's been embraced by senior courts around the world. It's part of European Union law formally, but again, importantly for our discussion today, given our focus on the Inter-American system, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights itself has affirmed the idea that this is a declaratory status, that refugee rights arise as soon as the person in fact meets the criteria, not simply when some state says that is so. So what does that mean? This extract from the UK Supreme Court gives you the basic idea, and it's actually, in my view, quite an extraordinary and creative approach to the acquisition of rights, in many ways much better, in my view, than what exists under any of the other international human rights treaties. This was only the second UN human rights treaty. They spent three and a half years drafting it. And what they sought to do was to reconcile refugee rights to the legitimate concerns of host states. Again, a topic very close to our heart 
given the idea that in theory underlies Title 42 of protecting Americans from the introduction of disease by means of a procedure that would deny asylum access. Effectively, what the treaty does is it provides that rights arise under five levels of attachment. Some rights as soon as a state takes jurisdiction over a refugee. Others when they're physically in its territory, including at its border point. Others when they're admitted to a procedure. Others when they are in fact affirmed as a refugee. And others when they've stayed in that state for a period of years. The idea being that not all of the rights arise instantly, thus enabling the state to accommodate unexpected arrivals to its own national priorities. Importantly for our discussion today, the two rights that I'm briefly going to mention, Article 31, which precludes the United States from penalizing people for unlawful or unauthorized entry, and Article 33, that prevents us from summarily expelling people with a well-founded fear of being persecuted, arise at these bottom two levels. Article 31, as soon as one touches the United States, including at a border point, uh, and Article 33 that actually applies as soon as the United States takes jurisdiction over a refugee, for example, including even if we were to send agents into Mexico or standing on an international bridge spanning the two countries. So the fact that the two rights that are most salient apply long before a person is even admitted to the U.S. process, much less granted a right to remain here, is quite critical in my view. So let's look just very briefly at Article 31, the duty not to impose penalties on refugees for arriving illegally. This exists quite frankly, because no country in the world grants a visa to come make an asylum claim. Switzerland did it for a period of years, it no longer does. The drafters of the treaty realized that the only way at risk people could arrive was ipso facto illegally. And because that was the only way to access the system, they should be exempted from any penalties for having done what necessity required. Interestingly, there's a bit of a smoking gun in the CDC public health order in that there is this reference in red to these being people who arrive illegally, which raises the question whether this was in fact, at least as initially conceived by the Trump administration, less about public health than it was about doing the very thing that Article 31 prohibits, namely penalizing people who show up without authorization. The more critical right, though, is Article 33, the duty of what's called no refoulement, that you may not send a refugee back directly or indirectly to face the risk of being persecuted. This is non-amendable, non-reservable. It's the cardinal rule of international refugee law. And importantly for us, that language in any manner whatsoever means that if the United States, for example, returns a refugee to Mexico, knowing that Mexico will in turn send them back to their country of origin, the United States is as much in breach of this duty as is Mexico. Again, the language to the frontiers, plural, not simply a duty not to send you back to the country of origin. The prohibition is on being returned to any territory in which life or freedom would be threatened. And that, of course, seems to me to be precisely what the United States is doing. There are only two exceptions to that rule, one of which clearly is not applicable uh, for individuals who've been convicted by final judgment of a particularly serious crime. But the one that I suspect, if I were in the US State Department, I would argue plausibly relevant is this one. Are these individuals arriving in the era of COVID a danger to the security of the United States? Uh, it's at least arguable. I think though that on balance, when one actually looks at how those notions have been interpreted by senior courts around the world, the US case would fall flat. Uh, this extract, for example, from a Supreme Court of Canada case, the same language in the UK Supreme Court, in the New Zealand Supreme Court, multiple common law courts around the world, that you can only use the national security uh, exemption when we're actually talking about a threat to basic state institutions, 
But most critically, there has to be objectively reasonable suspicion. That means, in other words, that it has to be an evidence-based exclusion in the individual case, something that Title 42 patently disallows. There is no such investigation. The, the second point is that it has to be a substantial rather than a negligible risk to rise to the level of a threat to national security. And in the context of a country like the United States, which already had millions of indigenous COVID cases, the idea that the arrival of a small number of asylum seekers who might plausibly similarly be affected could not plausibly, in my view, be thought to be a substantial rather than a negligible risk. I think that claim would fail. Critically, there is a less intrusive alternative, and it's handed to us by the second paragraph of Article 31. International law is not unaware of the fact that sometimes people arriving may present risks and that it does reasonably fall to the state of arrival to investigate their identity, their circumstances, and any risk they present. Not, by the way, by way of long-term indefinite detention, which the U.S. illegally has followed under both Democratic and Republican administrations for decades. That is just patently illegal. No if, and, or but about it. But what the United States or any other state party can do is provisionally to detain someone, for example, to test them, to treat them in quarantine, which would meet the public health objective of the United States in a dramatically less intrusive fashion than simply forcing them back across the border. Now, let me quickly just flag the three concerns that I think are out there. Having said to you that I think by and large international refugee law is a friend to a challenge to Title 42, at least in the context of the inter-American system where the openness to refugee law is clear. One is a horrible little decision uh, from sadly the United States Supreme Court called SAIL. Uh, SAIL finding that what I said to you about the non refoulement jurisdiction, uh, non refoulement obligation applying the jurisdiction is false, that it only applies once someone actually gets into the United States. That decision is just patently wrong. It has been condemned by every other senior court that has considered it. And critically for our uh, discussion, it has been formally condemned by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights as simply wrongly decided. Uh, ironically, the uh, Supreme Court drew on the drafting history to come up with its perverse uh, determination. One of the, the lead American drafter, uh, Professor Lou Henkin was still alive and wrote a wonderful piece saying, you didn't read the drafting history. I was at the table, this is not what we meant, and this is not what the duty says. Sadly for us though, at least in US courts, sale remains binding law. So the inter-American option where sale has been formally rejected uh, is likely more plausible. A second question that might arise is, are people really at risk of being persecuted in Mexico? Uh, some people, particularly US courts, have taken an extraordinarily narrow approach to the notion of what being persecuted means. No other country in the world adopts as cribbed uh, an understanding of being persecuted as the United States. The kinds of things that are happening in Mexico, not only serious health concerns, but physical violence there, easily meet the international standard, again, embraced by the inter-American system, of a sustained or systemic risk to basic human rights. That is the correct standard, the American standard, which nobody knows what it means, really bad stuff is about all the courts say, uh, is clearly not legally correct. But in US courts, that question might again arise. And, and the last question, and I think the most intellectually intriguing one, is there has to be a risk of being persecuted because of race, religion, nationality, or social group or political opinion in the place to which we send you. The irony, of course, is with Title 42, you send everybody. And so then the argument might be made that there is no nexus or connection to a convention ground, and hence Article 33, the duty of non-refoulement, isn't violated. 
On balance, I think that, again, is an unsound argument. Uh, the senior courts around the world have taken the view that indirect nexus is as much nexus as direct. So if you flee Honduras because of political opinion, that's the reason you arrive at the U.S. border. That's the reason you get pushed back into Mexico. Political opinion remains the indirect nexus to the risk of being persecuted and thus suffices. So my bottom line conclusion is that at least in the inter-American context, uh, to the extent that we have this really quite solid affirmation from the inter-American court of the salience of international refugee law in the adjudication of refugee rights in the inter-American system, refugee law is our friend and refugee law will help us to strike down Title 42, at least in the inter-American system. So I'll leave it there and I'll look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Professor Hathaway. I'll we'll turn next to Professor Gilman uh, to talk about the turn uh, to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I'm not intending to share screen right now, uh, Professor Hathaway. So if, if, if you want to just cancel yours out, that, that would be great. I will do that. Thank you. Um, so um, Professors Newman and Hathaway have made a pretty persuasive argument uh, that Title 42 is unlawful under both US and international law. So I can't help uh, but begin my comments by sort of thinking for a moment about how did we get here then? Um, because I think that also will then help to frame the thinking about where we go with the litigation and other strategies under both US or international law. And I do have a couple of thoughts on it. I, I think we've been building up over quite a few years, if not decades now, um, a conception of the U.S.-Mexico border specifically as being a site of danger, threat, um, danger, physical danger, likelihood of fraud, um, and that we therefore have also continually tried to structure new responses, enforcement-based restrictive responses at the border that are intended to serve as a deterrent uh, to asylum seekers who are seeking to come, either a deterrent to prevent them from coming in the first place, or a way of now more with Title 42, simply blocking them if they, if they do arrive, but then as a deterrent to others um, who might expect to come in the future. Um, that fraud, threat, safety, deterrent approach um, has been shown to be almost entirely ineffective. If anything, the numbers of arrivals continue to go up for many reasons, including dangerous situations in home countries and just increased refugee flows around the world in general. Um, they, uh, these approaches mischaracterize uh, fundamentally what is happening at the border in terms of who is arriving, what they are there for. Uh, we are largely talking about families. Uh, a majority of those arriving at the border are families uh, who are seeking protection and cannot be seen in any meaningful way as a threat. Um, and then these approaches, as we've been discussing, have largely been uh, unlawful. Uh, and uh, in terms of their uh, efforts to address the situation at the border in a way that really doesn't fit with the with the realities at the border. Um, so that's one thing that I think is going on. It's just this discourse of, of danger and, and deterrence. Um, another thing is that it, it does seem to me that some of the way we approach asylum law in the United States which is essentially a very limited, restricted view of what should qualify for asylum. Professor Hathaway talked about even the term persecution being very narrowly defined, um, has created uh, entire asylum proceedings take place in a defensive posture where uh, asylum is adjudicated in a removal proceeding where somebody's facing deportation, which is very different from what most countries around the world do. Um, and so I would argue that this very sort of restrictive view of asylum inside the United States has kind of pushed uh, outward 
to the border and even beyond uh, with external externalization measures like what we're seeing um, with Title 42. Um, not to say that other countries around the world haven't been hardening their borders to asylum seekers. In fact, I think they have, but I think it's a slightly different dynamic where in Europe, for example, uh, asylum proceedings inside uh, nationalities, nations inside of Europe are seen as being soft and, and somewhat generous. And so the border is seen as sort of the hard shell uh, preventing access. Whereas in the US, it almost feels the opposite, that kind of the hardness of, of asylum proceedings in the US is, is continually pushing um, outward. Um, and then finally, I do blame some of the international actors uh, for getting us to this situation um, because the law itself, as, as we've been discussing, seems quite favorable and protective. And yet, for a variety of reasons, uh, international actors like the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees have not uh, spoken up heavily and seriously enough when we've seen this hardening of the border over a period of time in the United States in Europe um, and, and elsewhere. And so there have been doubts about what exactly are the rights of asylum seekers at the border um, as sort of being treated as an, as an exceptional case. So I mentioned all that just to kind of put some thoughts. Others might have different ideas about this uh, around, you know, kind of what got us here and, and what led us to this place where we're having to seek recourse before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights um, to try to address the, the situation. What I just suggested, though, does, I think, um, suggest that uh, international law is deeply, deeply relevant. So I don't mean to suggest otherwise. I mean, the very nature of this is that there is this special sort of consideration set of considerations that taking that's taking place at the border, um, both in terms of rationale and policymaking and in terms of international law. And so what could be more appropriate than going to international bodies to look at an international border area, relations between the U.S. and Mexico, relations between the U.S. and international law and international bodies. And so it seems appropriate that we would go to a body like the Inter-American Commission on an issue like Title 42. Um, to be clear, just a couple of words about the Commission for those who aren't as familiar. Um, the Commission is an independent body, human rights body of the Organization of American States, which is sort of the regional system uh, for the Americas, like the UN is um, globally. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is really the only human rights body, especially adjudicative body, uh, where individual complaints against the United States can be brought because of the way in which the United States either doesn't ratify international human rights conventions or does not accept individual petition or case jurisdiction um, before those bodies. So, for example, the U.S. cannot be brought on Title 42 or anything else at this point for to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which would be sort of the next uh, stage after a decision from the Inter-American Commission, but the Inter-American Commission can and does uh, hear complaints against the uh, against the United States. Um, in terms of the rights that are being applied by the Inter-American Commission in looking at the United States, um, we are talking about the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man is understood to apply um, to the U.S. because of the U.S.'s membership in the Organization of American States. OAS has a charter that says the Inter-American Commission is going to look at compliance of all member states of the OAS with international human rights obligations, sort of writ large. Um, and the Commission has determined that the American Declaration is the best source of those rights um, when, when talking about uh, countries like the U.S. that haven't ratified the other instrument that could apply, which is the American Convention on Human Rights. Um, the Commission does use the American Convention often to interpret some of the general rights principles uh, set out in the uh, American Declaration that applies to the U.S. The American Declaration includes the right to asylum, uh, as Professor Hathaway mentioned. It also includes due process rights. It also includes the right to life and personal security um, and freedom of movement, uh, all of which are, are relevant uh, to this Title 42 discussion. 
So what have we as advocates done so far um, in terms of considering Title 42 before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights? Uh, a group of organizations have presented a request for precautionary measures to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on behalf of several named individuals and families who were expelled under Title 42 or who did not approach the border to seek asylum because of Title 42, um, as well as the request is, is set to cover others who are similarly situated. So it's sort of a class action um, type um, framing. Precautionary measures are focused on danger and harm. They are sort of a request for uh, protective injunctive type relief to stop harm that is likely to occur, to occur. And so that is really the focus of the precautionary measures request uh, on Title 42 to the Inter-American Commission is the potential, the grave harm um, that is potential. Um, in terms of how the U.S. treats precautionary measures, requests, or even decisions um, by the Commission, uh, essentially the U.S. always asserts that the uh, decisions of the Commission on precautionary measures requests are not mandatory or obligatory or binding. Um, but the U.S. does participate typically uh, in discussions, in proceedings around um, such measures. So it is a a forum where there is some back and forth in a, in a litigation sense. Um, the precautionary measures request that has been filed against the U.S. on Title 42 um, is still pending, just to be clear. Uh, there has not yet been um, any decision by the Commission, um, but we hope that there, there will be one soon granting the request, which would uh, serve to, if, if the request as filed is granted, uh, both protect the individuals who have been named and impacted, but would also call for the end of Title 42 so that others similarly situated would not be harmed um, in the future. There was a strategy question as to whether the request should be both against the U.S. and Mexico. Um, for now, at least, the request has only been filed against the United States, but it is worth remembering that the U.S. would not be able to expel to Mexico if Mexico did not allow that, and so that there are human rights violations implicated in Mexico's willingness to receive uh, expelled asylum seekers as well, and potentially the home countries that are receiving some expelled um, asylum seekers also. Four main harms are being argued in the precautionary measures request. Uh, one is that, as we've been speaking about all panel long, um, the Title 42 expulsions really just completely block access to asylum, uh, to asylum processing, to asylum adjudication. And thus they block asylum seekers from ever even having the opportunity to reach uh, the potential for permanent protection in the United States. And so that goes to this idea that they may be returned to danger. But there is also just this sense that even if they were to somehow miraculously eventually make their way into the U.S., they have been blocked from getting uh, up until now that protection, that right to seek asylum in the U.S., and that that is a, a harm in and of itself. There is also the refoulement harm that we've also been talking about all panel long. And to be clear, this is really kind of two sets of potential harms in return. One is the return to Mexico danger, um, which is all about uh, violence uh, in Mexico. Just in the last year, there have been well-documented 6,000 or 7,000 situations of kidnapping and actual physical attacks that seem to be quite clearly directed at those who are expelled by the United States. Um, there are cartels operating often with the support of at least some elements of the Mexican government that wait for those expulsions and target very intentionally um, those who are um, sent back to Mexico by the United States. So there's extreme danger in Mexico. And then there's the possibility of either direct expulsion by the United States all the way to the home country of persecution, which would be refoulement to danger in that home country that originally the asylum seeker fled because of violence there and the potential for future violence. And there are documented instances of people being returned and then facing harm in their home countries. Um, 
as well as the possibility of reformant to Mexico, which is itself problematic, resulting in indirect or chain reformant to the home country. So that the fact that somebody was returned or expelled to Mexico um, then leads to them either being physically pushed down further to their home country or because of danger in Mexico, being coerced into returning to the home country where they uh, originally fled from and, and faced danger. So that's reformant is one whole set of harms. Um, and then another one is just the cruelty at the border itself. We talked about the treatment of Haitians and there have been other instances in which border authorities have uh, themselves caused harm, US border authorities. So that's part of the danger that the precautionary measures seek to address. And then a final one is family separation. So we all remember uh, the horrific uh, incidents of 2018 when families were literally ripped apart at the border. But Title 42 is having a similar impact. First of all, we do know of some instances where uh, families arrive together and through the messy process of the Title 42 expulsions, they are separated. Um, but we also know that in some instances, because unaccompanied minors are currently excluded from Title 42, although not perfectly, um, but for the most part, if, a, if an unaccompanied minor makes it to the border or across, they won't be expelled under Title 42. Some families make the impossible decision to send their young children to safety in the United States on their own. Um, and thus uh, a family separation results. And so that's another um, one of the um, harms that, that the precautionary measures seek to address. Um, before wrapping up, so that gives a picture of the precautionary measures request. I just wanna mention that this request is part of uh, kind of a larger effort to address uh, some of the border policies that have had such horrible impacts on asylum seekers in recent years and that have been building up. There was a prior request to the Inter-American Commission um, for precautionary measures relating to the Remain in Mexico, the MPP program, which is the one where, as I mentioned, um, individuals would be put into U.S. asylum proceedings but sent back physically to Mexico to wait for those proceedings. And we have um, sought a meeting with the Commission uh, with both the United States and Mexico on both that other earlier precautionary measures requests relating to MPP and remain in Mexico and the newer precautionary measures request uh, relating to Title 42 in the hopes that uh, bringing together all of the relevant actors with the international body, the US and Mexico on kind of a slightly larger range of um, border policies might be a helpful way uh, to finally make some progress in ensuring that the promise of uh, both U.S. and international law as laid out so eloquently um, by Professors Hathaway and Newman um, would actually have some meaningful impact in, in terms of change at the border. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Professor Gilman. Uh, we'll now move to the question and answer section. Um, I have one question. Uh, from Professor Baba, uh, Professor Jacqueline Baba, uh, a friend of a friend to all of us, uh, asking what likelihood, in your view, is there the Biden that the Biden administration will abide by a positive decision from the Inter-American Commission? And maybe if I could uh, tack on to that, uh, the question uh, to Professor Gilman. Uh, what are the benefits of petitioning the Inter-American Commission if the government is going to argue, if the U.S. government is going to argue that its rulings are not binding? Right. I mean, this is always the the, the challenge with international law in general and, and with the Inter-American system um, specifically. Um, a, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I, I don't think that we should uh, disregard the uh, the potential for public pressure uh, that can result from the proceedings before the Inter-American Commission. 
Um, we did see that uh, after the precautionary measures request was filed with the Inter-American Commission on family separation, even before the commission actually ruled on it in 2018, along with, don't get me wrong, many, many other pressure points um, that a policy change did have to be made uh, even before the courts uh, fully, the U.S. courts fully uh, weighed in on that, although they were also moving as well. Um, so certainly thinking of the commission as one tool among many uh, to put pressure on uh, the administration to do the right thing. Um, and I think it's appropriate to think about the commission that way and to recognize that it's not so different in that sense from recourse to the federal courts. Uh, I mean, we know also that when we file litigation in a U.S. federal court, first of all, that the proceedings may be quite lengthy. Uh, second, we don't know what the final decision will be. And we don't know... Um, in the end, exactly uh, how the uh, government will, will comply with even a favorable decision in terms of uh, trying to keep its impact as limited as possible. Yet we, we go because um, we know that it's, it's one tool that along with many others um, can create uh, change, even though we recognize that our, you know, U.S. courts don't have an army to go enforce the decisions, nor does the commission. Uh, but there is a sense that uh, we can create uh, and have already created largely with the federal courts and maybe haven't gotten quite as far yet with the Inter-American Commission, the, the culture of a rule of law that insists that there is meaning to these decisions, even if they can't be physically enforced, and that that itself creates pressure to do the right thing uh, when, when the law uh, and policy decisions should be so clear. Um, so that's the main purpose. I do think that uh, the commission presents a unique opportunity, which Professor Hathaway really did highlight uh, better than I ever have, and I always get this question, uh, which is just that there are really great norms um, at the inter-American system. And so they provide an opportunity to take issues that we see as deeply problematic in the United States, but may not be readily addressed in our federal courts because of the limits of our federal courts or readily addressed in other ways and use a legal mechanism with legal norms to really address and tackle those problems. So that's the other thing I would say about using the commission. Thank you. Uh, another question asks whether the unlawfulness of Title 42 creates the possibility of individual criminal responsibility uh, for the officials who constructed and implement uh, the strategy, uh, possibly for subjecting persons seeking protection to inhumane treatment uh, or mass deportations as crimes that continue into Mexico, which is a part to the Rome Statute. Uh, would anyone like to address that question? I think that's a question for you, Jerry. I somehow thought that might be the result. Uh, so I'll say, uh, I don't think we're going to see criminal prosecutions in the United States uh, for people involved in implementing uh, federal, uh, federal policies. Uh, except to the extent that there are uh, isolated cases of wholly unauthorized excess violence taking place. Uh, and I'm afraid that even there, uh, the record of prosecution of members of the Border Patrol uh, for isolated violations um, is not um, encouraging. Uh, in terms of prosecution, uh, in the, uh, say, in the International Criminal Court based on jurisdiction uh, because of uh, being pushed back uh, into Mexico. Uh, I think there are uh, theoretical possibilities uh, that are unlikely, uh, unlikely to occur in reality uh, in that the, the legal theory uh, under which uh, the mass deportations would be treated as violations uh, of the Rome statute uh, are 
theories that require uh, would, would require more testing and support. Uh, that would be my response uh, to the question. I did have a student who did a whole paper on this and concluded that there were uh, possibilities there, probably in the vein of that uh, theoretical piece. I mean, I do think it's relevant that the numbers of kidnappings of people sent that take place immediately as they get off the bridge. And I've personally spoken to a number of families who've been in that situation. Um, and the extent to which those are documented and absolutely made aware uh, to the U.S. government, I, I, I would be happy with civil liability, uh, but, uh, but I think there really is something there in terms of uh, state-created danger and state responsibility. And Jerry, if I could just sneak in a last comment. Um, I know our time is coming to an end. I think everybody needs to put this in context. As of today, it is lawful for a vaccinated non-citizen to cross the U.S. southern border to go shop at Walmart. Now, in that context, the idea that there is not even a recognition that a subset of asylum seekers would be entitled to enter this country for reasons that are, quite frankly, trivial, uh, standing next to the full-on exclusion of those who come to seek asylum with no comparable exemption, it's just ethically intolerable. That is an absurd situation. And I'd also want to just insist one last time, the US cannot possibly invoke either of the two, and there are only two exceptions to the duty of non refoulement Neither is plausible. It has an alternative for unvaccinated non-citizens that it believes may present a risk. The Refugee Convention allows that in Article 31.2. It may short-term, short term, detain and test people to ensure that they don't present a risk. The duty to use the least intrusive alternative in a context even of potential risk is firmly established in international human rights law as much as in international refugee law. And for the United States not to be taking that approach is quite frankly shameful. There is no other developed country, indeed no other country in the world that has eviscerated asylum to the extent that the United States has in the name of COVID. We are not that administratively inept that we cannot cope in ways that others have been able. It is our duty to do that, and it's time to put this shameful episode to bed. Thank you, Professor Hathaway. I think that's a great way to end uh, this panel. Thanks very much to my colleagues for joining me. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to all of you who have been in the audience. <laughs>